Good morning. That was not quite enough. Good morning. That, that feels better. Thank you. I enjoy our Sunday service together, and I hope you do also. Um, it's fun being a pastor at times. I enjoy being a liturgist and getting to lead you in worship. I enjoy preaching, getting to teach you from the Bible. I enjoy representing you at the Lord's table, and I enjoy sometimes not having a role on Sunday so that I can catch up with you and meet new people. But three weeks ago, I did something I almost never do. I sneaked away to a different local church. Um, A young friend was preaching for only the second time, and I wanted to be there to support him. It was a terrible experience. (laughs) The sermon was fine. Um, But when I got there, I was unpleasantly surprised. There were several young adults and families that had always gone to Trinity on Sunday there. They acted embarrassed to be found out, but I acted cool. Uh, No guilt or shame from me. This is a strange and intimate uh, example because on the inside, I was actually hurt and discouraged. Secretly, I felt personally rejected and betrayed. To be honest, for the first time, In my ministry, I felt like I was in competition with another church. And I admit I was afraid because I was obviously losing the competition. I bring this up uh, because our passage has something to say about my experience, but what it says is very surprising. So turn, if you would, in your order of worship or into the New Testament to 1 John chapter 2. And I want you to listen for kind of a change this week. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from Him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, if you have been with us this Pentecost season, you know that we have been reading the letter of 1 John together. And you will notice, I hope this morning, two changes in the letter. The image of what has been, the image before has been of light versus darkness. It began with God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. But today the image changes. Now it's what's true versus what's a lie. The first change is from categories of light and dark to those of true and false. The second change I find is even more dramatic. St. John moved from talking about our behavior to talking about our knowledge. He has been giving us tests of discipleship that were manifested in our obedience, what we do, how we live. But now he is going to test our discipleship by what we believe is true. So got it? Light and dark changes to truth and lies, and the test of behavior moves over and makes room for tests of belief. Okay? This is where you say something. Okay. All right, here we go. 
He begins in an ominous tone, doesn't he? Children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. This is a sermon I thought I would never uh, preach. I'm very, I've been very fascinated by it. It is the last hour. The apostle taught his church to expect Jesus to return soon, to return and judge all that's evil in the world, to return to heal and renew all things, beginning his everlasting kingdom of justice and happiness and love. But that teaching, we have to be honest, that teaching was a hundred generations ago. What are we to make of that expectation today? Well, we are a Christian church that is descended from that of the apostles. And I say to you this morning that same apostolic message. Children, children, we are in the last hour. There is nothing to prevent our master from returning now in our lifetimes. We could very well be the last generation before the great consummation. And in fact, apostolic spirituality is to live in expectation and hope of his appearing. Eager for it, not dreading it. Hoping for it, not drawing away. And the marker of the, for the last hour for St. John was the appearance of Antichrist. What is this? Who is this? How do we recognize it? St. John is the only Bible author to use the term, but it is spoken about in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here's how Paul writes of it in 2 Thessalonians, okay? Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Paul's man of lawlessness is John's Antichrist. And so the teaching is that there is a character, a person, the Antichrist. But don't get confused. In our passage this morning, it's clear that there are also many Antichrists. The Didache, you may not have heard of the Didache before. It was a very early book in the Christian movement, a book that was written in the second generation of the church. Didache is short. It means teaching, but it was short for the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. That's going to be the title of my next book. The Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. But here's the point. If we are a hundred generations away from St. John, this was only two, and here's what the Didache taught. In the last days, the false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied, and then shall appear the deceiver of the world as son of God, and shall do signs and wonders. The earth shall be given into his hands, and he shall commit forbidden deeds such as have not occurred occurred since time began. So there is one Antichrist, but there are also many false prophets who operate in the same spirit. Throughout church history, there's something I don't approve of, okay? Throughout church history, people have often denounced their adversaries as being of Antichrist or even being the Antichrist. The early Christians thought their persecutors, like Nero, were Antichrist. I can go there. I remember being at a Christian concert, however, in the 1970s, in which Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's Secretary of State, was denounced as the Antichrist. I don't believe that was true. But dear ones, it's not just individuals. The church has also denounced systems, okay? Systems. The early church thought that the Roman Empire was Antichrist. 
and I have to agree with them. Protestants have called the papacy antichrist, and the Catholic Church has called Luther antichrist. And so what I find in history is it's no good just using that title for whoever is your adversary at any particular time. I think we can learn better than that. What do all these things have in common? How do we recognize this spirit if we come upon it? Well, here, I think, is the outline of Antichrist wherever it is spoken of. It puts itself in the place of God. It deceives people with its lies and sometimes with its apparent supernatural power. So it can be a person or it can be people or it can even be a system. But to go even further, there is an actual defining characteristic to the spirit of Antichrist, wherever you find it. And it is this characteristic which we are to be watching for, even in our day. Later in this same letter of 1 John in chapter 4, I'm stealing this from whoever's going to preach on that, St. John puts it this way, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Or the way that it's said in our passage this morning, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Okay. The one Antichrist, or the many little Antichrists, or the system pervaded by the spirit of Antichrist, share this, this. Are you listening? They are wrong about Jesus Christ in his identity. The church believes and always has confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God from eternity, always the beloved in union with God the Father, the eternal lover. Not a bad Father's Day text. Um, but, he, but Jesus is also the Christ, the anointed one sent by the Father, and he took on human flesh and human nature in the womb of his mother. He is at once both God and human. And so it's about the identity that Jesus shares with God, and it is also about the identity that Jesus shares with us, humanity. This is the faith of the Bible. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the church through all its generations. But every possible mistake, rest assured, if you go to seminary, you're taught them all, Every possible mistake has been made about this identity. I'll just give two. First, a mistake like Jesus was only a man, a good man who taught the truth, a great example, but merely a prophet. God could not become so small as to take on human flesh and nature. That's one way to get it wrong. Here's another way, a mistake like Jesus is God, but playing a certain role, pretending to be human, because God could not actually die on a cross, right? So there are mistakes about the identity Jesus shares with God, and there are mistakes about the identity that Jesus shares with humanity. However, the teaching is that the Father and the Son are such that to deny the Son is to deny the Father, and to confess the Son is to confess the Father. Now, this morning for the sacrament of baptism, are you allowed to have a favorite creed? Probably shouldn't admit it. The Apostles' Creed is my favorite because it's just what happened. Here is what we believe happened, right? I love it. But I'm now going to read to you from the Nicene Creed, which is way more theological, but actually needed for what we're talking about today because it condenses the faith, the very faith that Antichrist opposes. Okay, here we go. We believe in... Mm. 
It overwhelms me to think about it. Forgive me. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. That's where I'll stop, right? This is what Antichrist opposes, is what we have just read. If the Antichrist tries to deceive us by its behavior, we recognize it by its false message. It does not believe the truth. And here is the truth. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. The spirit of Antichrist wants to confuse us and mislead us and deceive us as to the identity of Jesus as the Son of God made human. And so St. John speaks to his church, the people he is overseeing, because people have gone out from them, he says. Those who went out have been deceived and left the teaching that they received about the identity of Jesus. And in leaving that truth, they have left the promise of eternal life that is found in Christ because he is both divine and human. He is our perfect high priest, our perfect redeemer, our perfect savior. Jesus Christ, wherever you are, whatever's going on, Jesus Christ understands your situation as a person from the inside. And Jesus Christ understands the limitless, eternal God from the inside. It is a startling mediation. This is the truth taught by the apostles from the beginning. And when the real Christ returns, it shall be as a thief in the night, meaning unexpected. But it shall also be as obvious as the lightning which explodes from the east into the west. So you do not need to be afraid. There is, no, there is so much that could be said here. But let me go back to my unpleasant surprise of attending another church. Although my friends have left Trinity, they have not gone out from us. They are not deceived by Antichrist. Their new congregation believes the teaching. They recite the creed. The faith of that church is true. It is not a lie. And so, though I may miss my friends, I cannot denounce them. The creed goes on to say, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I'm still joined to my friends through Christ and his true life, even though we may not see each other on Sunday mornings. However, I have other friends and even precious family members that I do worry for and mourn over. People who once believed the truth but have now left it. They have gone out. People who once believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, but now no longer do. This is not a matter of behavior. This is a matter of belief, of knowledge, of faith, of truth. I cannot pretend that it doesn't matter to me or matter to them. What am I to do? Well, this is painful, and so we have to be very careful. Since I love them so much, since I love them so much, I might allow my love for them to compete with my love for Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But Christ is preeminent 
in my affections and devotions. And so I am careful not to let anyone cool my love for the Son of God. And when you think about it, it is actually best for my friend who has gone out that they see my love for Jesus remains. We recognize the spirit of Antichrist as the denial that Jesus Christ is God the Son in human flesh. But measured that way, the spirit of Antichrist is all around us, isn't it? It talks to us at school or at work or in the media, at the swimming pool, at the book club, when visiting our relatives. How are we to respond? Although we are careful not to be deceived, not to let our devotion to the Son of God lessen, we do not have to be afraid. It's a matter of knowledge and a matter of devotion and a matter of our daily obedience. Here's what I mean. It is the task of the body of Jesus, the church. It is the task of this part of the body of, church, of Jesus, the task of Trinity, to take our knowledge, what we know to be true, into our world. Jesus Christ is, the, is God the Son made human like us and for us. And not only our knowledge, we take our devotion to Jesus Christ out into our world and let it be heard. The song for our journey toward eternity is a hymn of love, which is the voice of the church. It is the song of the spouse of Christ. And people need to hear it. And it's not only taking our knowledge, and it's not only taking our devotion. We live our truth in the world as daily obedience, to be seen. As this obe and this obedience is to love the people we can see in the name of God whom we cannot, but to love our neighbor supernaturally so far as he or she is called to be a child of God, we must look upon them with the eyes of faith and tell ourselves that this person whose temperament and character are opposed to ours is called to share the same divine life in the same blessedness with us. No one here is better than anyone else, right? Got that straight? We abide in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, we love people, even at great cost to ourselves. We think of the needs of others and the rights of others before we think of ours. Because that is the imitation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate in our world for our sake. Perhaps those who went out from us, perhaps, perhaps they will come back. We need to make it easy for them to do so. We want to build no obstacle to their return. And perhaps many who currently do not sh see the truth of Jesus Christ will come to believe that truth. We need to make it easy for them to do so. We want to build no obstacle to their knowledge of Jesus because, dear ones, I have found that the love of Jesus when it is smelled as the aroma, is very, very attractive. But we also, we have to be honest, we have to beware of deception. To abide in that which we have known from the beginning, we have to persevere in our faith. Because persevering is part of our love for God. It is part of our love for those who have gone out from among us. It is even part of our love for ourselves. So let me pray for us. Living God, living and God over all the generations of humanity, we thank you very much for the startling mediation in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God the Son, the eternal beloved, has come and taken on flesh and taken on our nature. So we thank you so much that you understand us and that you show your love for us in this. And I pray that you would help us to persevere, believing this startling good news with all our hearts. May we take our knowledge into 
our worlds, wherever they are. May we take our devotion and let it be heard. But may people see the Lord Jesus and his love through our love for them. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen.